Hello everybody, welcome back to the ASUS ROG YouTube channel. It's me, JJ, once again, and I've got another unboxing and overview for you. So today, we're going to be taking a look at our P9 X79 Pro Series motherboard. This is kind of really the sweet spot in our entire X79 lineup. The Pro Series really kind of always meets this kind of focus and demand of really kind of having all the key items that you're looking for on a board with not necessarily always carrying the premium pricing that might be in some of our higher end products, which while being really feature rich, sometimes the Pro really fits that slot in really well. So what we're going to be doing is taking a look at some of the key technologies and features that we offer on our Pro Series motherboard, as well as our X79 series of boards, and then also doing the general unboxing and the overview. So let's take a look here initially at the box, and we can see that one of the first things that we see called out really large is, of course, our dual intelligent power control design, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But this extends the award-winning exclusive design implementation that we previously had on our previous generations of board, which were offered a digital PWM or a Digi Plus VRM for CPU power delivery and control. But now we've gone ahead and extended that digital control and monitoring functionality to the DRAM as well. And that's critical for the 8 dim design and the overall overclocking potential for X79 series. In addition to that, we can see that we have a couple of key items that we're going to do that we have noted here on the bottom uh, that we're also going to be taking a look at here on the actual flap. So, Let's take a look here on the inside. You can see here that we've uh, talked one about our TPU chip. The TPU chip is actually a custom hardware IC that we have on our board that carries its actual own firmware. This actually hardware controller allows us to do some pretty cool things such as do uh, real-time auto overclocking, have some advanced preset easy overclocking options, as well as it gives us more advanced monitoring functionality for the board. We have our EPU chip. This also allows us to have some pretty cool specialized uh, functions for the VRM in terms of advanced real-time phase switching as well as undervolting uh, options for the actual CPU. We've got our USB BIOS flashback which is an easy method of being able to go ahead and either recover the BIOS from a corrupted state maybe from aggressive overclocking or you could easily go ahead and update the BIOS via this actual USB port and a flash drive. The really cool part though is that no CPU, no memory, no graphics card is required. All that you need is the PSU standby power. USB 3 Boost is a new exclusive ASUS technology, just like these other items, that allows us to do some pretty cool things in terms of increasing the performance of any standard USB 2 or USB 3 device. Um, these devices can be shifted from their legacy mode of operation bot into a turbo mode of operation, which is SCSI, or if you have a new UASP device, we fully support this new level of operation, and this can significantly extend the performance of a USB 3 device operating under UASAP. For our fan expert, we'll get into this a little bit more when we look at the hardware level functions of the board as well as actually some of the physical controllers, but this is a brand new revamped option that we're offering in terms of advanced hardware uh, control for the actual fan headers. And then we've introduced a new codec package with DTS Ultra uh, PC2, which is offering real-time uh, support in terms of multi-channel encoding from two-channel content uh, via the DTS Connect option. So now that we've taken a look at some of these things here on the flat, let's actually take a look at the board. So first we actually have our padded Q-Shield. Q-Shield actually serves for two functions. One, to actually be softer and easier to go ahead and actually install inside the chassis. But also this actual special implementation helps to block actually EMI and interference from coming through the actual exposed black plane and affecting the overall sensitive trace layout that occurs for not only all the I.O., but as well as actually for the dim uh, banks that are actually underneath there as well. So that's actually our Q shield. We've got six SATA cables. So there's two in each pack, so that gives you a total of six, with four of these being SATA 6G connections. So we can see here the actual PCH has six ports, just like on C68 or P67, with two of them being SATA 6G. And our ASUS SSD caching ports are also SATA 6G, so we're giving you six, uh, four cables altogether for those uh, four SATA 6G ports. We've got our Q connector, one for the actual power leads for the actual chassis, and then we have a Q connector for the USB port. We have an extended blank SLI bridge. And then, because this board supports three-way SLI, a hard three-way SLI bridge. And we have our P9X79 Pro User Guide and Manual, our support disc, 
and then a quick outline on actually how to correctly install your Sandy Bridge E processor into the actual 2011 CPU socket, uh, just because this socket actually is a bit more complicated to work with in terms of actually having two retention clip mechanisms that actually have to be open and adjusted. So make sure to read that before you install your CPU. All right. So now taking a look through there, let's go ahead and actually take a look at the board and some of the actual exclusive hardware features that we actually have here. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and take a look a little uh, at some of the actual fan headers that we offer here when we're talking about that fan expert. So let's go ahead and count these guys up. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, six PWM fan headers. So this is awesome in an enthusiast level board. And when we talk about the actual, not only the number of them, but the positioning, it's really optimal. You can actually see over here in our actual backplane, we actually have a P9X79 Pro board set up into this awesome Corsair carbide chassis. And we're taking full advantage of the actual chassis as well as the actual uh, the fan header layout. And see here that we actually have a 120 millimeter fan here, another 120 millimeter fan here. We then have a 120 millimeter fan for actual uh, Corsair H60, and then we have two more here in front of the chassis. This actual layout is optimal because, as you can see, having actually uh, these five fans allows us to actually connect them all fully to this motherboard and have full flexibility actually being able to control these. Normally on most motherboards, you're going to see that they might offer usually maybe a competitive uh, amount of actual fan headers. Sometimes they're only going to be three pin, not four pin. Um, but generally you're going to be very limited in terms of the fan control functionality. Most of the time it's either going to be on or off or maybe a basic slope option or maybe just one preset. For us, we really led the industry in fan control functionality and our previous generation of boards, we offered a high number of four pin fan headers and we did offer full manual fan control for the CPU and for chassis one. But now we've gone ahead and kicked it up quite a bit where we're offering full manual fan control for up to five headers on the board with the last fan header following what's called a mimic behavior. So it's really nice in terms that I can go ahead and set maybe my uh, top fans to go ahead and maybe be a standard preset um, so that they run on a standard profile. Maybe my front intake fans, they're going to be running at a quieter, uh, slower RPM level. And then maybe my chassis fan, which is connected to my H60, it's going to be more tweaked specific to the cooling parameters that I want depending on the load and the frequency that I have for my CPU. So that flexibility is really key. So moving forward there from the actual fan headers, let's take a look at some of the actual other onboard connections. Some of the most immediate ones here we have here on the bottom. So here we have an onboard debug code, which is an awesome option for users that are more advanced and understand the actual debug codes that come up during the actual post process or boot process that could be affecting your system from working correctly. Now, independent of the debug code, we do also have a more readily understandable diagnostic system for users that are familiar with debug codes, and this is called QLED. For QLED, we have LEDs at key points on the motherboard, such as we have one here for the DRAM, we have one for the CPU, we have one for the VGA, and we have another one for the boot device. Here you can see also the one for the VGA here. Now, depending on the actual post process, what will occur is that if one of those devices is potentially having an issue when the system is attempting to post, that LED lock, light will lock and actually let you know that that's where you should be looking at. So if you were to maybe set up your system and you didn't have maybe the module fully rested in place, the DRAM LED might go off. You can see that and it goes, okay, I have to go double check my DIMMs and I'll be good to go. Sometimes a little bit easier than maybe seeing 70 light up on the debug code and not knowing what it means. Moving over to the rest of the actual bottom connections here, we have a front audio header connection. We have a hardware power button, hardware reset button, and then we have an EPU switch. The EPU switch is actually pretty cool. What this does is it's focused for users that are doing stock level operation, but are interested in getting a little bit lower idle temperatures, as well as overall lower temperatures under full load and helping to bring back the power consumption envelope a little bit. This doesn't affect at all the actual performance aspect of the system, but what it will do is execute an undervolt. The undervolt is essentially just supplying a little bit less CPU voltage to the CPU at the same operating parameters to go ahead and get a little bit better efficiency extend uh, the overall lifespan of the product. Moving over to the rest of the connections here, we can see that we have three USB 2 headers. This is key for things like a front USB 2 port on your chassis or maybe a media card reader that might connect to it or other types of devices that might use a front USB 2 header. We then have an onboard Claire CMOS button. That's that red button right there. So in the event that maybe the board is too aggressively overclocked and you wanted to attempt to go ahead and just reset it back to defaults, you can go ahead and hit that button and be good to go. 
And then lastly, we have one more physical switch here with the TPU switch. This is an easy way to go ahead and have your system overclocked right out the box when you're first setting it up. If maybe you're not somebody that's interested in getting the highest level overclock of your system, but you really want to bump up the level of performance, all you got to do is flip this switch and you'll approximately get 4.3 gigahertz out of the system with the flip of the switch. Keep in mind that your baseline frequency uh, for taking, for instance, on the 3960X, it's going to be 3.6 gigahertz. It's a pretty big jump up for just the flip of a switch. So moving over in terms of the PCH connectivity, we can see here that we have eight serial ATA ports. So we have the six that are natively supplied by the PCH. We have two SATA 6G ports. We have three, excuse me, four uh, SATA 3G ports. And then we have our two SATA 6G SSD caching ports. These two ports are the ones you're going to want to use for our exclusive SSD caching implementation, which just will allow you to, in one click within AI Suite 2, connect either a um, SSD and a mechanical hard drive and go ahead and get an amalgamated level of performance uh, with, a, with an SSD and a mechanical hard drive. Now, when we're taking a look at the rest of the connectivity, we've got some other options that we do want to call out, such as the PCIe connectivity. When we talked about the actual accessories that came included inside the box, we talked about the board supporting two-way and three-way. So we can see we have a real optimal layout for that. When taking a look here at the board, you can see that we've got dual slot spacing so that if you want to go ahead and run two cards with having spacing in the center, you definitely have that available to you, as well as still having the available space that maybe add in a wireless card, maybe add in a more advanced RAID controller, sound card, any number of different PCIe-based connections. If you're utilizing even up to three-way, the great design that we have here allows you to do three-way without overhang. So you could do two, uh, two slot card, two slot card, and then another two slot card. If you're using triple slot cards, you could still do two triple slot cards without any overhang. So three here, and then another three here. So you've really got a great deal of flexibility here. When actually taking a look physically, what we've got here, we have a physical by 16, a physical by one, a physical by 16, a physical by 16, another physical by 16, and lastly, a physical by one. Uh, with your blue slots being your primary electrically physical by 16 for optimal by 16 by 16 configurations. So moving over here to the top portion of the board, we can see that here that we have a nice uh, extended actual heat pipe for the actual BRM. Now on our P9 X79 series boards, we're utilizing a custom uh, VRM and PWM system. This is our digital power control or dual intelligent processors 3 design. What this really does is gives us the most advanced control at the CPU VRM power delivery and monitoring as well as the control in terms of operation. And this now also extends over to the DRAM, which in complex configurations can really be key at helping to ensure better stability. One thing to take into consideration for like an 8 dim design is that the trace layout on this side of the board is far less complicated than on this side of the board where you have much more interference and much more traces from the back I.O. So being able to have the flexibility of modifying parameters per each bank gives you a lot of flexibility of being able to tune the overall reliability and the performance of the board, especially in more complex densities. Uh, this digital design as well as with our UEFI really helps to ensure that we also have a high level of tuned performance in terms of allowing 1600, 1866, 2133, and even greater speeds than that for DDR3, uh, even in 8 dim configurations, assuming that your memory controller uh, meets the demands for that. So underneath this, we can see that we have our advanced uh, new chokes that offer a very high level of actually uh, current power delivery. We also have our new dual end MOSFET package design, which integrates the high side and low side MOSFET, while it keeps the actual driver independent to maintain the best temperature performance as well as ensure the best overall power, power efficiency and power delivery. Now, moving uh, away from this part of the board here, we're going to take a look actually at the back I.O. Back I.O. is going to really have a lot here because we're took on a pretty rich board. So first and foremost, we've got our white USB port with our USB BIOS flashback button. What this actually allows for us to do is something that's pretty cool. We can go ahead and update the UEFI, or what's sometimes referred to as the BIOS uh, in its legacy term, but without actually having a CPU, memory, or graphics card installed. All that's required is we just have to have the PSU standby power, and that's it. So just take your flash drive, plug it in, hold this button down for about three to five seconds, and that will automatically low-level overwrite the actual chip. 
Now, in the event that maybe you overclock the board too hard, you could potentially corrupt this ROM. You can also use that same mechanism to go ahead and attempt to re-recover the ROM and get your system back up and running. So, outside of this port running the USB BIOS flashback button, when this is not depressed, this serves as a standard USB 2 port. So we see here across the board on the top, we've got four USB 2 ports. Here, we've got two USB 3 ports, which counted with these two USB 3 ports, and then the front USB 3 ports gives us six USB 3 on this board. The cool thing about this board is just like the rest of our X89 series, we support a technology called USB 3 Boost. This is a great way of extending the performance for any USB 2 or USB 3 device. Um, you can shift it from running in a legacy mode of operation that's generally referred to as bot, and we can shift them into our turbo or SCSI mode of operation, which gives you better throughput and performance. And for a UASP enabled device, we natively support that mode of operation, and that will significantly extend the performance of that UASP USB 3 device. Here we've got an Intel native Gigabit Ethernet controller, so that saves us one PCIe lane, but also gives us the advantage of better performance, better interoperability compatibility, plus a lot of the advanced functionality that we have exclusive to the Intel driver stack. We've got our optical and Toslink output. We've got two eSATA powered uh, 6G connections. We then have two additional USB 3 uh, ports that feature the USB 3 boost, two more USB 2 ports, and then we have an integrated BT 2.1 plus EDR header. So this is great because this goes in and lets you have the flexibility of being able to uh, connect to a number of different peripherals like a keyboard, a mouse, a BT headset, um, as well as sync easily with your phone or a number of different BT enabled devices. We take it even further in that we give you actually a custom application that you can actually load on a number of different uh, mobile OSs where you actually have the ability to let's say power on the system, power it off, monitor temperatures and voltages, or even stream music or media, um, or you can also even do internet tethering. So a lot of functionality that you have with our custom BT Go, BT implementation. Lastly, we have our standard 7.1 HD audio, which when matched up with this actual new 892 Realtek codec, actually gives us the DTS2 Ultra PC package, um, which does offer us the cool ability to take any standard two channel content and go ahead and actually hardware mix it into multi-channel. The last item that we'd want to call out here is something that's pretty cool still, is that we have our Memo K button. The Memo K button, considering that we have an 8-dim design, is really going to be a critical item. In some situations, you might potentially have memory, where if you're taking an older generation a kit of memory and mixing and matching them, uh, so you maybe have a previous 4-dims and you're adding another 4-dims, the SPD data that gets no initially loaded might not be fully compatible. So if your system were to potentially lock or not post, and maybe you get that DRAM LED lock light, you could go ahead and press this Memo K button, and on a hardware low level, it would attempt to go ahead and make adjustments to uh, timing parameters, as well as frequency parameters, to go ahead and try to get those memory modules to work optimally. So another exclusive feature that we have here on the P9 X79 Series Pro board. So that gives you a little bit of an overview as well as the unboxing on the board. If you have any more questions or comments, definitely hit us up here on the actual YouTube page or make sure to visit us over at the ASUS ROG forums. Thanks for checking us out.